So once again, good morning, folks. Uh, my name is Tonya Lovejoy. I am proud to be the executive director here at Friends of Virgin Islands National Park. Today's seminar is a celebration of Earth Day. We're doing Earth Day all week. Of course, Earth Day is every day and our role in protecting and preserving our natural and cultural resources for future generations, as well as our enjoyment today is an everyday task. Um, so uh, I'm really honored to have Jeff Miller, um, who has recently retired from our Virgin Islands National Park, is certainly still our expert biologist um, and um, marine ecologist um, here in the Virgin Islands, and particularly for St. John. Um, he has circumnavigated these waters and is intimately attuned, and so we are really honored and blessed to have both his professional expertise and his very caring um, eye on our coral reefs today. Katie Day is also joining us as an expert. She comes from the Surfrider Foundation, but also has a personal connection here to St. John and is giving back by volunteering to share her knowledge and expertise with us. She has been instrumental in pushing um, information about the toxic chemicals in some sunscreens that harm our reefs and um, work to change policy um, here, both in the Virgin Islands uh, to ban non-reef safe sunscreens as well as Hawaii. Um, so we're really honored to have both Jeff Miller and Katie Day presenting to us. I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic um, without further ado. So Jeff, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Tony, and thank you to the friends for uh, inviting uh, myself and Katie. We really appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to you. And folks, thanks for taking the time to join us today. I know your time's valuable. Um, you know, there's no doubt that, um, let's see, let's get it to go ahead. No doubt that this is a really beautiful place. And many, many people come to the Virgin Islands because of its beauty. I think, personally, and I think Katie agrees, one of the best parts of the Virgin Islands is the underwater part. And so between herself and her new job and what she does is outreach as the environmental science and policy manager with the Surfrider Foundation and myself as what I used to do with the park, we'd like to take you on a little tour underwater um, and show you the world from our eyes and uh, talk about some of the things we can do to help protect reefs. So when you get to work underwater and spend a lot of time in the water, um, you get to see a lot of amazing things and I imagine then they get to see you. So it's kind of an equal opportunity to get to know each other. There are some amazing critters, these gray angelfish and French angelfish. Uh, I mean, sometimes you stumble upon a wall of tarpon that swims by. Occasionally there's a large predator that happens to drift by, but it's always not always the really big critters that are the impressive ones. Sometimes you get fish that are doing a service on top of fish, like these little gobies here, or like this yellow coney with this little cleaning goby that's actually right near its eye. So sometimes you have to look really, really closely and take your time to see some of the really cool things in the water. For an example, this sargassum fish uh, photographed by Dr. Caroline Rogers is really hard to see, and it kind of can bring it into focus here in the algae and the sponges. Its eyeball is, is located right there. So it's not always the big obvious things that jump right out at you. Uh, here's another one of my favorites. This is a flying Gernard, and my, my pencil there is in the foreground kind of for scale. This guy is about uh, two inches in size, maybe about four centimeters, and just absolutely spectacular if you get a chance to see him. And then this, who knows, you know, is there anything even in here? Um, but with a really discerning eye, you can pick out what is a decorator crab you know, as he actually raises its claws and um, and is kind of waving hello or saying, hey, put me back. Um, they're just absolutely thousands and thousands and thousands of amazing animals that inhabit these reefs. And they're all here because of the reefs. And that's that's the, the fabric that weaves together the spaces for them to exist. So let's take a closer look at, at these coral reefs and, um, and begin to understand um, you know, what they do for us and what we do for them. Many of you recognize Elkhorn coral. If you've been snorkeling around hawk's nest, this is something that you see fairly readily there. And if you take a close look at the tip of Elkhorn coral, you can begin to see the coral, st the coral structure 
Uh, it's made up of individual polyps, and those polyps have tentacles out at the end of them that pull food into their mouth. Another example of this is the large star coral. Um, each one of these circles is an individual animal. Um, it is able to survive and live uh, uniquely by itself, but yet as they grow in a colony, um, they make themselves larger and more robust in the environment. So each one of those is a polyp. They make up the entire colony. Inside that polyp is a mouth, and around that polyp, in a circular fashion that you can kind of see here, are a ring of tentacles. And those tentacles are kind of like the hands of the corals. They go out, especially at night, where this photograph was taken, and they expand into the water column, and they're feeding on little stuff that floats around in the water, little plankton. And that's where coral gets uh, some of its food. But another important thing to understand about corals is most of its energy doesn't come through this feeding by these tentacles into the polyp mouth. Most of the energy comes from the sun. Living in the tissue of the coral are photosynthetic algae cells, millions and millions of cells called zooxanthellae. These algae cells are like the solar panels for the coral. And in the space about the size of your fingernail, there can be a million to two million of those plants. So those are densely packed solar panels, and they do two things for the coral. And this is important to remember. They help give the coral its color, and they help give the coral its energy. And we're going to talk about that energy thing um, a little bit later on. But these corals, you know, what you're looking at here are the tentacles that are expanded from the polyps um, and the mouths down inside. These are corals that secrete a hard skeleton. They're called hard corals. Um, some corals don't secrete a hard skeleton. They look like bushes and trees and shrubs. These are sea whips and sea plumes. They have polyps that have tentacles that surround mouths. You just have to look very closely to actually see those. And yet they're still animals. They're, they're colonial animals and they grow in this colonial form to give them a more robust structure in the water column. Some corals look like brains. So we call them brain corals. That kind of makes sense, I guess. Some corals look like pillars. Um, they grow in these large upright columns and uh, we call them pillar corals. And then the most common coral around St. John is the small star coral. So pretty much any reef you see besides hawk's nest is gonna be dominated by these small star corals. Um, other animals that inhabit and make up the reef are sponges. They come in just an amazing variety of colors, shapes, and sizes. They're absolutely incredible. And they're very expressive. They've found ways that they can communicate with each other and tell you when they're happy in their day. Or if you tell them a good joke, they'll crack a smile. Um, squid are part of the coral reefs, as well as anemones and turtles and jellyfish. And all these things are there because of the reef. They are there for us to go out and enjoy and get great pleasure in the observation of them and commune with them and, and just really enjoy their presence in, in our world. But let's think about what do coral reefs do for you? What do coral reefs do for us? How do we benefit from coral reefs? One of the things that's very well known that coral reefs do for us is they help protect our coastlines and our shorelines and our homes and properties that are on the shore from wave actions during storms. Um, as such, you consider a healthy coral reef to be the front door of the Virgin Islands during a storm event. If coral reefs become really unhealthy, it's like leaving the front door open during a storm. And we all know that that's, that's not a good thing to do. So, Coral reefs protect us from, from the wave energy of storms and, and they can be like our front door. They're also really important economically. I mean, right now, thousands of people throughout the territory are heading to coastal beaches and out on boats and going snorkeling. Um, the number of businesses and goods and services that support all these people generate many, 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 many dollars for the economy. Um, so healthy coral reefs can be considered a a contributor to the stock market of the Virgin Islands. I mean, healthy coral reefs are good for the, 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 the economy. They bring in a lot of money, they bring in a lot of people. They also are tremendous sources of biodiversity. Those millions of species that, that inhabit coral reefs can easily become sources of future medications and compounds that can save a lot of lives. So it's really important um, that healthy coral reefs 
um, are good for our environment, um, they're good for our economy, and good for our health. Um, one publication um, puts this economic benefit throughout the Caribbean um, in the neighborhood of four to five billion, that's with a B, um, dollars from healthy coral reefs. There's also the social impact. I mean, it's not just the visitors that drive benefits from the coral reef, but the residents of Virgin Islanders and our children are the future generations that drive great pleasure from this environment. They're learning how to live and work successfully in such a beautiful place. So as such, reefs are like schools or learning centers. Unhealthy reefs are like when schools are closed. We, you know, unhealthy reefs deny our kids the opportunity to learn what we've learned and see what we've seen. Healthy coral reefs give future generations the ability to discover and chart their own future. And I think there really isn't any value, any numeric dollar value that, that we can put on, on that kind of value from reefs. They're amazing places, no doubt. But right now, coral reefs are in extremely dire situation. Um, there are many factors that have brought reefs to this peril condition, and, and I wanna talk about those right now. I don't think anybody in the Virgin Island has to be reminded about uh, hurricanes and the power of storms and how devastating that can be. Um, this is Hurricane Irma. Um, both Maria were tremendously devastated in 2017. So, um, you know, the the forecast for more, bigger, stronger storms is, is just the way things are going now, and they have a tremendous impact on reefs. There is no doubt here locally that seawater temperatures are getting warmer. So in this figure from the Park Service, along the x-axis, the horizontal line there, are, are years from 1988 to 2001. And on the y-axis, the vertical axis, vertical axis, is the number of days the water average water temperature is above 29 and a half degrees C. That 29 and a half degrees C is a, is a theoretical fresh threshold at which the corals become uncomfortable. That temperature really stresses them once it gets above 29 and a half degrees. So if we look at the number of days per decade that the temperature exceeded 29 and a half degrees, if we look at the first decade in this data series between 1990 and 99, there were 46 days. In the second decade, it increased to 167. In the third decade, it was nearly 300. There is no doubt that not only the number of days, but the frequency of the years in which these corals have to deal with elevated thermal stress is increasing. Now it's a year like 2018 when we don't have any excursion of that, that bleaching threshold, that thermal threshold, um, that is unusual. It used to be that when we had an excursion of that 29 and a half degrees, that was the unusual part. So what this means for the coral is remember that I told you that the coral gets most of its energy from the sun. These pictures of very healthy coral reefs, their color is really good. It's that greenish brownish earth tone. And remember coral gets their color and their energy from the species and the concentration of those plants that live in their tissues, those millions and millions of solar panels that live in their tissue. So when the water temperature is above that bleaching threshold, the coral reefs expel those zooxanthellae. They vomit them out their mouth and they lose the thing that give them its color. They lose the things that give them their energy. These corals are alive. They're essentially starving. Now they can tolerate this for a short period of time, but if this, this thermal stress, if the temperature is above 29 and a half degrees for too long, the corals will succumb to uh, lack of nutrition, lack of energy, and die. So water stress, water temperature stress directly with coral bleaching is a significant stress. Coral diseases um, have been a problem in the Caribbean for the past 50 years. Um, Elkhorn coral had a disease 30, 40 years ago. We had a massive disease outbreak between 2005 and 2007. Coral reefs are now experiencing another massive disease outbreak called stony coral tissue loss disease. It is, as Tony said, as if a wildfire is currently, right now, burning through the reefs of Virgin Island National Park. Um, this is unbelievably devastating. 
I mean, the corals that are dying from this disease are the corals that survived hurricanes Irma and Maria. They're the corals that have been surviving all the thermal stress only now to die from coral disease, another coral disease outbreak. And this is a, this is an underwater landscape. It's a seascape altering event. I mean, this is changing the fabric, the basic building blocks of the coral reefs. So it is unbelievably serious um, stress that's impacting the reefs right now. Sedimentation and runoff is a tremendous problem. This isn't from a hurricane. This is from Rod of Spear in just a thunderstorm from a number of years ago. This is looking from Mongoose Junction over to the Scoops uh, dining area. And that is a Jeep that's getting washed down the road. So we have to learn how to better control sedimentation and, and nutrient runoff. The stuff that's on the land that washes down into the reef when we get these really strong storm events and even in our, our daily thunderstorms. Um, we have to be able to better manage the sedimentation and, uh, and uh, uh, nutrient runoff from our shorelines. Um, sea urchins are back in the news, sadly. Um, sea urchins are very important herbivores. I'll touch on that in a second. And unfortunately, right now, in mass, they are dying again. And this is absolutely devastating. Um, this happened in um, 1983, 1984, Caribbean-wide. Um, scientists don't really know what happened to the sea urchins then. Scientists aren't really sure what's going on right now. Um, it's just absolutely devastating because, as I said, sea urchins are major herbivores. And when they are not there, the bottom becomes overgrown by plants. See, coral grows extremely slowly and plants grow fast, especially when they're fueled by nutrients and sediment and wastewater runoff that comes in from poor land use practices. So when that high nutrient water gets into our coastal waters, the macroalgae blooms. And that, that's problem for the corals because there's no place for them to then grow. The way we say it is that the macroalgae outcompete the coral for the available space. So there's no place in this picture because it's covered with plants for baby corals to begin to grow. And that's another huge problem. And then there's of course the things that we and visitors directly do to the reefs when we come visit it to enjoy it, which is we drop anchors on it, we drop our maps and our pollution and our towels and our bottles. We touch it, we kick it, we stand on it um, mostly because we don't know what it is. We, we don't know that that is a living animal. I mean, I might swerve my car to avoid running over a chicken, but then I'll stand on top of a reef because I don't recognize it as an animal. So if we know that corals are animals, we know that we shouldn't stand on them, we shouldn't stick on them, we shouldn't kick them, um, we shouldn't uh, drop anchors or anchor chains on them. All these impacts eventually add up and they have a, an impact on the coral. So let's talk about coral cover. And before I go into that, um, what is coral cover? Um, I get that asked that often, and probably the easiest way to describe it is through these four pictures. And you can definitely see that there's different amounts of hair that cover these heads. And one way that scientists measure coral reefs is looking at the amount of coral that covers the bottom. So if we take a look at a figure of coral cover, each one of these different color lines represents a different study site around St. John. Uh, this is from Park Service coral cover data from 1999 through 2023. You can clearly see the effects of the dramatic disease outbreak between 2005 and 2007. Over 60% of the corals at these study sites died during that time. Since 2005 and 2007, the corals remain relatively stable until hurricanes Irma and Maria and now we can see all these lines are going down because of the effects of the stony coral tissue loss disease and the other effects that take place on the land. If corals were people, they would be in critical condition. They would be on life support equipment in the hospital. And it's really important that everything we do when we're around coral reefs is to take care of them. Um, every living piece of coral 
is more important now than ever before. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Katie to talk to you about the things that we can actually do. This is the really important part of this whole presentation is these are the things that you can do every day, every week, every month to help protect coral reefs. So take it away, Katie. Thank you, Jeff. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I was born and raised in the Virgin Islands. So this is um, feels like it'll forever be my home. My family's still there. So I'm down often. So um, I'm honored to kind of give this presentation. I'm going to go ahead and mute Jeff. Um, give this presentation um, locally because this is such an important area. And it's so great to hear the local expertise from Jeff. And yeah, what we just heard is really heavy and um, it, it's really sad, but I don't want people to feel like all is lost. You know, there are some things that we truly can do to give our corals a fighting chance. There are these big global processes that are underway that are having a devastating impact on our reefs and are really severe stressors, right? Climate change, exacerbated storms, um, ocean warming, ocean acidification, but there are all these local stressors that Jeff was talking about as well, right? Sedimentation and runoff and physical damage. And it's those local stressors that are local opportunities to actually help protect the reef and increase their resilience and strength so that they're better able to handle these other stressors that are still to come. And that's where we come in, right? Here are things that we can do as individuals and collectively as a community to really help protect the reefs that we still have and increase their resilience so that they're stronger and have a fighting chance. Next slide, please, Jeff. So first, number one, use responsible sun protection. This may seem like a weird thing to be related to reefs, but as many of you know, um, with recent legislation, there is an effort to kind of start talking about reef-friendly sunscreen. Next slide, Jeff. And getting into this, I want to talk about the importance of sun protection, right? So the sun can be very harmful to our skin. Um, UV radiation is no joke, and UV rays are very strong in the Virgin Islands, so close to the equator. And it can have severe harmful impacts to our the deep layer of our skin, the dermis, the outer layer of our skin, the epidermis, um, based on the type of UV rays that are coming through. And so how we usually combat this is we cover up and we use sunscreen. But how sunscreen works is usually one of two ways. It either absorbs and scatters that UV radiation through the, U through the use of chemical ingredients. That's like your oxybenzone, octinacid, octocrylene types of sunscreens. Or it reflects the UV radiation away from your skin. And those are your physical blockers. Those are minerals like zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Sometimes you'll see them combined together, but for the most part, you have your chemical sunscreens and you have your physical sunscreens. Both can be very effective. And then you've also seen SPF, right? SPF 30, SPF 50 written on these sunscreens. SPF stands for Sun Protection Factor. It's an acronym. And I wanna flag that SPFs are not additive. And what I mean by that is when you see SPF 30 and you see SPF 90, SPF 90 doesn't mean that that sunscreen is three times as effective as SPF 30. Um, there, it is more effective in that it blocks some more radiation, but it's by a very small amount. So SPF 30 on its own blocks 97% of UVB rays. When you go all the way up to SPF 100, that's only an increase in two percentage points from 97 to 99% of UVB rays. So I'm not saying that that's not important and not valuable because the more protection, you know, the better, but it can cause this false sense of security and safety when you're using these higher SPFs. Also quick flag, SPF is only relevant to UVB rays. If you don't have a sunscreen that's broad spectrum, then you're not getting any protection from UVA, which can cause you know, melanoma and all sorts of really harmful cancers and skin aging. So make sure when you, when you do choose sunscreens that it's um, broad spectrum, or as we'll learn in a second here, that it's physical blockers as opposed to the chemical blockers. Next slide, please. And the issue with high SPF, in addition to this false sense of security that you're like super protected, is that to get that higher level of SPF, 
requires more active ingredients in these sunscreens. And when it comes to chemical sunscreens, this is a big deal because instead of just having a little bit of oxybenzone, you need a bunch of oxybenzone and avobenzone and octocrylene. So if you look at the back of a sunscreen label between SPF 30 and SPF 100, you will <coughs> literally see that there are more chemicals for the most part listed on that higher SPF sunscreen in order to reach those higher levels of protection. And the problem here is that your sunscreen, when you put it on your skin, doesn't remain on your skin. I mean, you're literally were told to reapply frequently because it rubs off, especially when you're in the marine environment, when you're snorkeling or surfing or um, just going for a swim. It's an estimated that over 14,000 tons enter of sunscreen run off and enter the marine waterways every year. And that chemicals, they stay intact. So they're not that they just break down and you know dissipate. They may di dilute, but it still can be harmful and remain toxic for months on end in those waterways. And then high density beaches like our very own Trunk Bay where you have, I mean, back then it was 2000 daily visitors when the cruise ships were in. It might be even more now. I don't know with COVID, you guys will probably have a better feel than me because I've been out of town for a while, but it's highly concentrated where everyone's snorkeling in that same area. But when they're all smothered in these chemical sunscreens, and that's all rubbing off into the waterway, you're having this high concentration of these chemicals in one area. And one sample showed over 1,000 parts per billion of oxybenzone from that sample of water. To put that into perspective, uh, in the lab, coral bleaching can start at just five parts per billion of oxybenzone. So these are really high concentrations of these chemicals that are coming off of our skin while we're snorkeling, while we're trying to protect ourselves to enjoy this beautiful environment. Just as Jeff mentioned, sometimes when we're doing things to go experience these beautiful places, we're actually contributing to their demise and causing problems. And why this is a big issue, next slide, please, is that it causes marine life impacts, right? These chemical sunscreens are toxic to marine life across the board from green algae to corals where it accumulates in those tissues it can kill that zooxanthellae that jeff, jeff was talking about so exacerbating coral bleaching um, it prevents uh, corals um, from being able to reproduce or successfully you know have spawning events to create new corals um, it can cause impacts to shellfish it impacts to marine mammals to dolphins it's been shown to bioaccumulate in their tissues and actually be passed down to their young um, just from exposure to oxybenzone in the waterways, similar issues to urchins and fish. So what we're seeing here is while there's all these other issues, right, these stressors exacerbate each other. So you have one thing causing bleaching from heat stress, but then you have another thing exacerbating that bleaching effort from the pollution that we're exposing these creatures to in the marine environment. Next slide, please. There's also potential human health impacts from um, sunscreens. And I know I'm going really deep into sunscreen. I just want to take this opportunity before we dive into the other 10 things that you can do. Um, but when it comes to sunscreen, chemical sunscreens, it's physically designed to be absorbed by our skin. So every application of sunscreen of oxybenzone, 4% of that gets absorbed by our skin, um, which is an organ. And sadly, it's actually getting into other organs in our body. 97% um, of people tested, I believe the sample size is about 1000 people had oxybenzone in their urine, meaning it's getting into other organs in our body. It's been detected in breast milk. So just like with dolphins passing it on to their young, there's a potential for humans to be doing the same thing when we're putting sunscreen on ourselves um, when you're you know, pregnant or when you're, when you're breastfeeding. There's also, also other ingestion pathways. It's not just oxybenzone in the sunscreen. It can be in our plastic products, in our food containers. And when you have hot food in a plastic container, those chemicals from the plastic can leach into your food that you're then ingesting and putting into your body. So another quick flag of, of trying to avoid single use plastics for many reasons, including your own human health. And it's got to the point where the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration has even recommended removing these chemical sunscreen additives from generally recognized as safe and effective, their GRAS program to you know, no longer being considered GRAS Unfortunately, the cosmetics industry is a very strong lobby in our Congress and our federal government, and they were able to negotiate like a three year extension so that these chemicals can still remain on the GRAS list and they have three more years to try to prove that they're safe for human use, 
even though they've had 30 years and have yet to been able to prove that this is something that we should be able to put on our bodies every day, all day, especially, you know, in areas like St. John, where you're out in the water and you're like, I grew up on a first mate as a first mate on my dad's boat. Um, doing giving snorkel tours to tourists and I would cover myself in sunscreen every day not realizing the impact I was having on the marine environment and potentially on myself as well next slide so getting back to you know number one what can you do for using responsible sun protection is switch to reef friendly sunscreens and pair with sun management sun management is covering up right only having certain parts of your body exposed that you then need sunscreen on but you can have you know, a long sleeve or a rash guard and a hat on to cover the other parts of your body so you're not just like lathering it all over yourself. Also avoiding sun uh, exposure during peak sun hours, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. can help protect your skin. When you do use sunscreen, pick for reef, more reef friendly. So that's those physical blockers, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. They're much less harmful to marine life. Um, avoid spray with titanium dioxide because unfortunately, that's considered a group 2B carcinogen when it comes to inhalation. So you don't want to be inhaling it. It's okay to go put on your skin, but try not to use the spray uh, mineral sunscreens that have titanium dioxide in them. So the good news is the Virgin Islands passed legislation in 2019, which was a really big and proactive deal. Um, it was the strongest sunscreen, you know, reef safe sunscreen ban. Uh, non-reef safe sunscreen ban uh, in the United States. We were able to pass a similar bill in Hawaii right before this, banning oxybenzone and octanoxate, um, but that was just the sale. In the Virgin Islands, this bill bans the sale, import, and use of these chemical-based sunscreens that contain the most toxic three O's, right? That's oxybenzone, octanoxate, and octocrylene. And this went into effect in March of 2020. So right as COVID was ramping up, I don't know how effective the enforcement has been on this bill, but the fact that it exists and there's all this effort to build awareness about the importance of switching to reef friendly sunscreens is really valuable, really powerful and a great education opportunity for tourists and locals on the island about how to you know, most responsibly cover up. A quick note on the term reef friendly. Reef friendly is not a regulated term. So some sunscreens will literally say reef friendly sunscreen written on it, but that means nothing. You have to actually physically turn the label around and read the ingredients. And it's under the active ingredients, which will show if it's truly reef friendly or not. And that's where you want to make sure it's just those minerals. You don't want to see any of those oxybenzone, avobenzone, octanexate, octocrylene, um, because that's yeah, there's, there's just no regulation over this term, unfortunately. So you do have some greenwashing that's taking place and it's really on us to be educated as individuals to like do the due diligence ourselves and actually read the label. Uh, next slide. Okay, sunscreen, done. Next, other things you can do. Number two of 10 to help protect coral reefs is as Jeff said, realize that coral is a living animal just like dolphins and whales and sea turtles and fish that we you know, love and appreciate and that we're excited to see when we're out snorkeling or swimming or on the beach. Corals are the same way. They are a living organism that's incredible and deserves our appreciation and recognition as a living being, um, not just a rock that you know, seems like it's, it's dead or not actually alive. These are, these are, these are living animals. Next slide. And in that uh, consideration, number three, don't touch, stand on, or kick coral. These things, again, they're alive, but they're also delicate and sensitive. Those polyps that Jeff zoomed in on, those are really sensitive. So if you're touching the reefs, especially if you have oils on your hands or the natural oils that are on our skin, the physical um, impact of just touching the reef itself can cause damage to those polyps and essentially kill those individual animals that as a colony make up the reef and make up that entire coral head. Um, similarly, sitting on the reef, standing on it, touching it, um, when you're snorkeling and you're kicking, even if you have fins on, even if you're not physically touching the reef, but you're really close to it, that movement of your um, flippers can actually also help ex exacerbate damage to the reef if it's like a, 
a softer coral. So try not to touch it or sit on it. If you're tired, look for sand to stand up in. Don't just plop your feet down anywhere and be mindful when you're snorkeling or swimming in shallow environments that do have reefs present. You know, really try to keep yourself horizontal and, um, you know, a safe distance away from the reef. Next slide, please. Additionally, number four, don't drop anchors or anchor chains on coral. Who here has been snorkeling and seen anchors just dropped on corals from boats nearby? I know I have quite a few times. And I even have been on a boat where a friend was purposely aiming for reefs when they were dropping their anchor so the anchor would catch. No, no, not good. The anchor catches in sand. That's what it was designed to do. Same with the chain. You want the anchor and the chain to lay completely flat in sandy environments. That's where your boat's the safest and that's where the marine environment is the safest. Always look below before you throw. Make sure that anchor and the chain as well, which is big and heavy, is landing completely in sand and not on the reef. Next slide. Uh, similarly, number five, don't drive boats into coral reefs. This is good for your boat as well as the reef. Um, all joking aside, uh, the islands have a ton of reefs, right, that are quite shallow and can be hard to see if you're, you know, boating at night or there's a high glare on the water if you're unfamiliar with that environment. So if you are going to be bare boating or you're boating in the area, Make sure that you plan ahead, that you get the right maritime maps and plan your route, identify where there are shallow reefs and what's the safest way to get into those relevant harbors and marinas because so often you have boats and distracted drivers, that they don't just exist on the roads and our highways, right? Distracted drivers exist in the water as well and they can ram right into reefs and cause physical damage as well as you know pollution, put people in harm's way you name it. Next slide, please. Number six, mind your nutrient loading. So when we say nutrients, right, we usually think of it as like a nice healthy thing that we're putting in our body. But nutrients can also be really harmful to our local waterways. And when I say nutrients, I'm talking about fertilizers like phosphorus and uh, nitrogen. And while these are great for our plants, um, when too many get into our waterway, when too much of this nitrogen and, and phosphorus gets into the waterways, it can exacerbate and fuel those algae blooms. And they can even fuel sargassum blooms that are at a state, you know, where it's over, a little bit of sargassum is great, it's healthy, it's important. But thick, thick mats of sargassum, not really great for anyone involved. Um, same with, you know, algae smothering corals and preventing them from being able to do photosynthesis. As Jeff said, blocking areas for new corals to grow since they grow so fast. When we put too much, too much nitrogen into our waterways, we're fueling those blooms that are out competing our corals. So mind your nutrient loading means maintain your septic systems. Our waste as humans has, is highly concentrated with nitrogen and fertilizer, nitrogen and phosphorus. So when we you know, have our septics or we have our local sewer plants and that gets dumped into the waterways as well as all the bacteria and other viral particles that are in that, um, if your septic is not working properly or, or our you know, wastewater treatment plant is not working properly or it's only doing primary treatment, it's releasing all of those uh, nutrients out into the waterways, which eventually makes their way into the ocean as well. So maintain your septic systems, make sure that you do have you know, that three foot buffer between your leach field and the water table. Um, and you know, help prevent runoff. If you're doing landscaping, don't just smother your landscape with a lot of fertilizer because your plants can only absorb so much of that fertilizer. And a lot of times we over fertilize. So try to, like this morning at the native plant sale, opt for native plants because that can actually help the reef because then you're not having to put as many fertilizers on it. It's acclimated to the local climate, the local landscape, um, you can use composting instead of these chemical fertilizers. Next slide, please. And then seven, don't allow sedimentation to run into the sea. This is a big deal when you're doing any earth movement or construction. Um, so we just need to be mindful of you know, what we're doing upstream and how it impacts downstream because 
are steep hills on St. John, um, loose soil. When you're doing any land clearing, you're removing vegetation, you're reducing the ability of that soil to be maintained and held by those roots. So when you clear the landscape and you have high rain events, that's allowing for you know high sedimentation to take that rain to take that sediment, uh, that soil into nearby waterways and smother reefs. Next slide, please. Eight, eat sustainably sourced seafood. This also has an impact on our reefs. There's certain fish that are really important to our reef health. For instance, parrotfish, they help control the algae growth on our corals. If we overfish parrotfish, well now you're removing that ability of the corals and that ecosystem kind of self-regulate itself. Um, so if you do eat seafood, try to make sure that you're eating sustainable seafood. Easier said than done, but there are some great resources out there like the Reef Responsible Program, Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium Seafood Watch, where it will just kind of indicate what types of fish are a little bit uh, more sustainable and how are they harvested to be more sustainable for the marine environment in general, not just reefs. Next slide, please. Number, number nine, which is kind of relevant across the board, is understanding that what we do on land and upstream impacts coral reefs downstream and local waterways. So when you're you know, overfilling the dumpster down the road, or when you see trash all, all on the ground by the dumpster, or pollution around the dumpster, when you're doing land clearing, when you're um, working on your septic, when you're fertilizing your lawn, all of these actions that we do in a seemingly completely unrelated on the land, it can actually eventually make its way into the waterways and into the ocean, especially on a small island like St. John. Next slide, please. And finally, number 10, use your voice. We live in a democracy. We have this amazing opportunity to help decide who is gonna be our decision maker in public office. And it's up to us to do our due diligence and our education to learn about these legislators and these candidates and how do they feel about the environment? How do they feel about sustainable economic growth? Is it use as many resources as we can now to make as much money as we can now? Or is it balancing and acknowledging the fact that these areas, these ecosystems, especially our marine life and our local reefs are essential for the future of our island, for the future of our sandy beaches and our, and our tourism industry? Next slide, please. So in conclusion, one more click. Coral reefs matter. They need our help and our actions have an impact. And it's up to us as individuals and as a community on what we want that impact to be. If we want it to be negative and continue to you know, contribute to their demise or to really finally have a positive impact on these environments and give them a fighting chance. Next slide. Here's a nice summary of the 10 things that we just covered um, of what you can do to protect coral reefs. Next slide. And I just wanna give a huge thank you. A thank you to Jeff for all of his incredible work that he's done um, studying these coral reefs and the marine environment at large in the US Virgin Islands. Um, he's been a mentor, um, whether he realizes it or not to me since I was little and always looked up to the research he did in our local waterways to the friends for the incredible work that they've done. They are also supporting the friends is another great way to protect your local reefs. And to all of you for showing up today to learn more about our reefs, what you can do to take part in their protection. And yeah, I wanna open it up to any questions you guys have. I know we went a little bit over. Thank you so much, Katie and Jeff. I only cried about five times. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box, um, so I will look for those chats. Um, I see one has come up here, and Katie, uh, if you're able to see those chats, you have a question there. Sure, Would, yeah, so I have yeah. a question from, Fran from Franz. Would like to be able to send future renters of our house guidance about sunscreen, including the names of some that are acceptable. Where and how can we get those names? Um, great question. And yeah, having your you know rental property be a space for education for tourists is an incredibly powerful opportunity. So that would be amazing to have some resources listed there for them. 
um, I think Tonya, I believe the friends even has some one pagers, right? About um, more reef friendly sunscreen options. We do. Um, you know, one thing that you pointed out in your uh -oh. um, reef safe, and you really do have to look at the ingredients. Um, here on St. John, you'll find that only reef safe sunscreen that has been vetted um, is being sold at Chelsea. Um, as well as the Friends of the Park store. You could go to VI Eco Tours. Um, there's a couple of different brands. The Badger brand is my favorite. Um, and I will try to make a point to find a good list. I do want to emphasize what Katie said is, you know, don't just read a list, read the ingredients and understand um, what all is in the product um, because things do change and companies do try to um, present themselves as reef safe when they're not. Um, we should not have any sunscreens that are not reef safe allowed in the territory or sold anywhere in the Virgin Islands. I think our St. John businesses are, are very self-regulating and doing a great job. And Chelsea has the largest selection that you could go and physically see. I'll try to get a list for you, Fran, as well. There are hundreds of you know mineral sunscreens yeah. available now um, and they become way more financially like affordable they used to be quite expensive and now they're on par with chemical sunscreens which is great so that's where it's that education of yeah just reading the label but if you want to have a couple um as tonia said yeah badger raw elements i can send tonia um a couple of resources to, to send your way or share with the attendees of this um webinar for those that want to learn more about a couple um, ones that we vetted and I, that should be available on St. John, but Tonya will have the better local perspective there. Um, Adrian asked, you mentioned that mineral sunscreens are less harmful, but are they still potentially harmful? Yes. Mineral sunscreens are also potentially harmful in high concentrations. Anything that we have, any, you know, external material that gets into the marine environment can have an impact and it likely could be a negative impact. So the only completely reef safe thing that we can do when it comes to sun protection is covering up. But we need more than that, right? We can't cover up everything. We can't cover up our skin, our hands or our face when we're snorkeling or when we're surfing, um, the hats will come off. So we do need to have, you know, some additional sunscreen on our bodies so mineral sunscreens, while they can be toxic in high concentrations, they are much less toxic than chemical sunscreens. So it's not like a perfect solution, but it's significantly better for our reefs and better for our human health. I don't know, Jeff, if you have anything else you want to add to that? Nope, that's good. That, that's exactly on target. And then Jeff, um, I think so you have the next one. Sorry, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, Jeff, you've got a question queued up here. So um, that's the eternal question. The hope for the future of our coral reefs. What gives you hope? Yeah, things like this. I mean, in 1983, 84, when diadema died off originally, um, you had to hopefully get a phone call. You couldn't send a fax. You couldn't send an email. You um, had to send a letter if you wanted to communicate to a neighboring island about a problem that you were having. Here, Katie's in Arizona, um, who knows where everybody else on this program is. So you have the ability to inform people at a much greater level. You have ability to get people activated in a much greater level in an immediate way. And that's something that this generation, and it, 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 it just has over what we've had in the past. So as these solutions, these, these 10 things you can do, get out further and further, um, they can spread to people more rapidly than they could in the past. And that's what gives me hope. People like Katie, who grew up here and have studied this and then are, are taking it further, um, is, is it's that generation um, and the next generation that, that really um, are gonna be the drivers of change. And I'm hopeful for the activities that they're doing. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I see the next question here um, from Nan asking about the possibility of a coral nursery being built on St. John. 
Um, I will share with you what I know, and then certainly, um, Jeff, I welcome you to chime in. Um, Friends is actively um, interested, pursuing, investigating, talking with as many people as possible about trying to grow coral. Um, that is something that, that gives me hope. Um, as Jeff pointed out, and Katie, you know, with that list of 10 things that humans can do, we know we can grow coral. Um, can we keep coral alive um, by mitigating the impacts that negative impacts that humans have? That's really what we what we need to be focusing on. Um, I do think there are initiatives to grow coral that technology has gotten much better. We understand a lot more. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you have any specific examples or um, add-ons to that. Um, I do think growing coral may, will be in the near future for, uh, for St. John and Virgin Islands National Park. Um, sure, I mean, I can't yeah. speak for the Park Service, but coral restoration is part of the answer. Um, but as, as Sonia said, you can spend millions of dollars literally to grow corals, put it out and somebody drops an anchor on it. And that doesn't make sense. So it, it costs very little money to do these steps that, that Katie and I have outlined here um, while the coral restoration is taking place. So you reduce the impacts of the, th the local stressors. Um, you let the scientists figure out what's going on with this outrageous disease because we don't wanna put out corals while things are still dying. So let them figure out what's going on with the disease. Sadly, let the disease kind of move through while your your coral nursery activities are taking place um, and then work on your outreach so that when those restored corals are put out they have a chance of survival um, not only from the coral disease side of things but from the human impact side of things that they're not going to get involved in a big uh, nutrient runoff out of a gut um, because of a construction project up on a hill um, or they're not going to get an anchor dropped on them because the person didn't know they weren't supposed to anchor there. So it's the combination of all those things together that are going to be the solution. Um, any one of them in the vacuum isn't going to work on its own, um, but it is part of the solution. Thank you, Jeff. And I'll just add here, um, there was comments about reaching out to villas and reaching the maritime community. Um, and, you know, one thing that's so interesting for me here as a new executive director of the Friends is I get to look through the 30 year history of the Friends. Um, and I have to remind myself that we are constantly passing the baton and many people have been spreading this message for a very long time. I think of Jacques Cousteau, um, it, it, we just have to, to keep on going. Um, so right now, what the Friends is doing is we are trying to um, launch a marine stewardship program, partnering with local charter companies, getting our staff, our sea turtle protection uh, manager, program managers and other folks, experts like Jeff on board these vessels so we can give our captains and crew the scripts that they need to be able to communicate effectively. As a former boat captain, I know very well you have a script and you say it over and over. And when people laugh and give you tips, it works. And so if we can just tweak that script a little to have the right information, um, then we'll reach today's um, marine stewards who are working right there on the foreground. We also do reach out to villas. Um, so I appreciate wanting more information that tells me we need to do more. Um, and, uh, and again, you know, you all here are also advocates. And so please do um, consider yourselves armed and able to spread the word as well. And um, don't hesitate to reach out for resources um, to, to share with your folks. And we'll try to be proactive as well. Let's see, I have three more questions here. Um, so just scroll down. There's helpful resources, um, airlines, absolutely reaching people before they get here. Um, and then Cynthia's question on the current reality of the enforcement in the VI. Um, that is a great question. Uh, we were recently at a uh, reef symposium that was hosted um, by Island Green, uh, which Katie, Day, and Jeff have both worked with. They were instrumental in getting that legislation passed. Uh, the reality. So 
Our customs um, folks are used to reading ingredients on labels. I was told specifically they have to regulate things like CBD oils and many other products that come into this territory. However, uh, I was also told in total transparency that the uh, um, customs enforcement in the VI was um, moved to focus um, on, as part of the COVID task force. And so they certainly have not been um, that has not been their priority. The timing of the ban of the non-reef safe sunscreen ingredients happened to be the day uh, that the territory closed down for COVID um, back in 2020, March first time. So we are trying to reinvigorate folks with the knowledge of this ban. And we do have the territory, Senator Blyden and Senator Payne met with us as well as the governor um, promising that this law will be enforced. Um, again, St. John businesses are doing a really great job of policing themselves. Um, and I think you will see that um, on St. John that we are, we are doing a pretty good job right now. That's a great question, Cynthia, because I was actually going to ask the same thing. So I'm glad to hear that there's been some acknowledgement of the need for it. And there's been, you know, interest in actually enforcing it. But as Tonya said, I think a lot of it will come down to community enforcement. And so Absolutely. spreading the word. And if you see a, chemi a chemical sunscreen for sale, kindly let the business owner or the person working there know that, hey, this is actually outlawed and you could get penalized for it. So just kind of spreading the word can be really valuable. I would agree with that, Katie. And one thing that, um... I'll say this tongue in cheek, but um, enforcement likes to do is hand out fines. So when we find people violating and they get to give a ticket, um, uh, so you, you can do some self-policing there um, for the greater good. Well, we are just at the top of the hour. I am just uh, so grateful. What a great presentation. This is recorded for everyone. I'm going to bring us to a close here. Um, again, this will be shared back with you as participants. You'll see it on the Friends of the Park website as well as our social media. Um, keep on subscribing, keep up the good work. Katie and Jeff, thank you so much. Um, I'm always happy to learn and you gave me some really, really beautiful lines in there to share with people that are very poignant. So um, thank you so much. Katie, we look forward to seeing you back on St. John soon. Sure hope so. Thanks so All much, right. everyone. You're quite welcome. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Earth Week. If you're on St. John, visit us on Friday. Jeff will be at the core. Uh, booth talking about coral reef health and you can meet him in person and ask more questions and get some fun resources. Without any more questions, I will bid you all adieu. Thank Thanks you again. Bye.